My name is Michael McAfee, President and CEO of PolicyLink, and thank you for joining us today for our webinar, Racial Equity, the Whole of Government Responsibility. Today, I'm going to be joined by several colleagues who will be in, will be in conversation about the next generation of the work for the racial equity moment. We believe that this is a moment where we have an opportunity to compel our federal government to become anti-racist over the next 20 years. And President Biden is the first president to name equity as a responsibility of the federal government. Now the administration has an opportunity to deepen this work and ensure that the federal government finally serves all people. We have a chance to create institutions that are worthy of this multiracial democracy that we have. Policy Link and Race Forward have joined forces to align strategies and support the federal government in its work to advance racial equity. But this work is bigger than our two institutions. We are committed to partnering with equity leaders across the country to work with the federal government to meet the ambitions set out by the racial equity executive order. Today's event is about exploring what the next phase of this work requires of all of us. Glenn Harris, president of Race Forward, will be joined in conversation by Nse Ufak, CEO of the New Georgia Majority. And we will also hear from Sharad Baines, Deputy Director of the White House Domestic Policy Council for Racial Justice and Equity. But first, I am honored to be in conversation with the Honorable Congresswoman Presley. And Congresswoman Presley, before we start, I just wanted to wish you a very happy birthday. Thank you very much. If I could sing, I would sing, but you, you don't want to. <laughs> okay, I, I can hear Stevie. I can hear Stevie. All right, all right. You know, don't you worry about that. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, thank you for your leadership on this issue of racial equity. I wanted to start with the question around the Biden administration has been committed on day one to advancing racial equity through whole of government. What have you seen be, as being the biggest successes? Well, first and foremost, I think it's really a testament to the administration's commitment to racial equity that the executive order was signed um, on the first day. Um, mm -hmm. And as you said, this is, um, has never been done before. Um, and I do think that we find ourselves at an unprecedented moment and inflection point uh, as a country. Uh, I've always maintained that policy is my love language and that is because um, hurt and harm and racial injustice have been um, exacted and codified in our laws. Uh, and so if we can legislate hurt and harm, inequity and racial injustice, then we can legislate equity, healing and justice. And so um, to sign this executive order so that we can do exactly that across the board, uh, this is exactly the first of its kind um, sort of bold moves we need to be making at an unprecedented moment, unprecedented uh, legislating and unprecedented investment. So it's a huge step in the right direction and I've been, uh, closely um, following its implementation. And we've been in ongoing communication with the Biden administration officials charged with coordinating across all federal agencies and offices. And the administration has been particularly successful in engaging experts um, such as PolicyLink um, who really know what it takes to do this correctly. And again, PolicyLink and Race Forward are, are testaments uh, to that fact. Now, beyond executive orders, uh, the Biden-Harris administration have really pushed Congress to advance legislation which centers equity. So from proposing and signing into law the American Rescue Plan, putting forth the Build Back Better Act, to calling for an end to the filibuster in order to pass the Voting Rights Act. But to be clear, um, we can and we must uh, do more to really meet the moment. President Biden has an unprecedented opportunity uh, and a responsibility. I think to uh, provide sweeping relief to millions of families by canceling student debt. And he can do that with the stroke of a pen. And this would certainly disproportionately benefit black and brown families and help us to close the racial wealth gap. Uh, President Biden can also use his clemency power uh, to dismantle uh, mass incarceration. And he can end the um, weaponized and scientifically baseless use of Title 42 which has disproportionately impacted Black migrants seeking asylum. So this is signing this uh, racial equity executive order um, is a bold step in the right direction. It's the first of its kind. Um, and, and again, we have much to do in, in the name of a sort of implementation of that, but also um, you know, other work uh, to take on to make this real. Thank you. You're signaling work um, in a couple of domains. 
the first that I heard you talk about right now with President Biden is his his personal leadership. There is a way that electeds can take up the role of, of racial equity and advance it by doing what they already are authorized to do if they chose to do so. And that's quite powerful. Thank you for sharing that. But let's stay on your love language for a second in, in Congress. What if we really wanted to make sure that this racial equity executive order was embedded into the workings of government so that the practices that undergird our desire for racial equity were implemented every day, what would you recommend? Well, you know, again, I, I do think it's critical that we remain squarely focused on policies and budgets that codify the value of Black life. Um, of Black lives. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in, against the backdrop of this national reckoning on racial injustice, truly the only receipts that matter are policies and budgets. So, you know, first, I believe it will take recognition that equity is a worthy goal. We unfortunately still have folks opposing the very merit and the idea of equity as if every person has the same opportunities from birth. Um, so we still find ourselves in the space of, um, um, persuasion, uh, conversion, and, and, and unlearning, if, if, mm -hmm. you know. So um, I quote uh, Kimberly's uh, sister, uh, my sort of one of our thought leaders uh, in this space, Kimberly Crenshaw, and she explained, you know, quote, that treating different things the same can generate as much inequality as treating the same things differently, unquote. Mm -hmm. So this recognition really must be matched by an administration with processes for meaningful and intentional inclusion by a Supreme Court that will not strip civil rights and constitutional protections by a Congress with legislation that is bold and truly rooted in systemic change. For generations, those in power were very intentional. They were very deliberate in legislating hurt and harm and they were precise. So we must be every bit as intentional and deliberate in legislating healing, justice and equity. And that needs to be a mandate, you know, um, a decisive, unapolog unapologetic and vigilant mandate for every member of Congress, every agency head and the president. Ultimately, this is going to require political will and courage to get this done. Well, thank you. One last question for you. Those of us on the outside of government, how do we join with you and support holding the whole of government accountable for advancing this work, but doing it in a way that is productive? Sure. You know, well, uh, to quote another uh, sibling in the movement, um, you know, sort of a uh, and an architect uh, in this, this movement and someone who I respect tremendously, Latasha Brown of Black Voters Matter, you know, organized power is realized power, right? And so um, we need the pub public to uh, be, be sustained in, in their organizing and their mobilizing and their demanding, just as the early architects of the civil rights movement and those, those first chapters were, you know, they were disciplined, you know, they were sustained. And I, I think ultimately your question does go to the heart of what I mentioned in my early remarks about the sacred right to vote. So yes. it's sacred because it is valuable and powerful. And so it's really your ability to hold people in office accountable. Um, my mother, may she rest in peace and power, was a, um, a super voter. She took me with her to vote in every single election. And I'll never forget her turning to me and telling me, never forget that, that, we, are, that we the people are powerful. And I believed her then and I still do. Uh, now and it's important that that organizing that mobilizing that engagement not just be limited to an election cycle we have to do the work of movement building we have to do the work of actualizing justice of actualizing equity so you know engage your members of congress and senators demand that they prioritize racial equity in their legislation and every vote that they cast and tell them to hold agencies accountable at committee hearings someone has to call the question. There's no intention if no one calls the question. So again, organized power is realized power. Continue to organize, continue to mobilize, and, um, and continue to push those in positions of authority to demonstrate the political will uh, to make this real. Well, thank you. You know, your leadership inspires all of us. It gives us hope that we can do work for many years to come well past this executive order. Um, as we get ready to transition to the next conversation that we'll have, any last words you have for our audience? Just that um, 
I, I want uh, the, the movement to give itself credit. I want, you know, uh, Policy Link and others to give itself credit. The fact that this racial, uh, this executive order even exists is a testament to the strength of our movement. And so that's why it's important that we remain vigilant. I know at times we can be, you know, weary um, that um, we are still having to do the work of, of educating people, you know, of persuasion, of, of conversion, of things that should just seem uh, integral and, and essential uh, and fair on their own. And I'm asked all the time if I'm growing apathetic or cynical and my response is always the same. I don't have the luxury. Too many people are depending on me or depending on you uh, to stand uh, in the gap. So, um, you know, you all certainly embolden and fortify me in this work. And I just wanna say that um, the state of our movement is strong. That's right. Well, thank you. Um, I wish you a happy birthday. Thank and, you. Um, the gift of your existence is is um, profoundly realized in all of us. So thank you. That was very kind. Thank you all. Thank you so thank much. You. Now I would like to introduce my brother, Glenn Harris. He is the president of Race Forward, and he will be in a conversation with Insei Umfa. Glenn. Michael, thank you so much. And um, I have to say, uh, just such a pleasure to hear you and Representative uh, Presley getting real about what this work means. And I'm so excited because we get to continue this conversation with uh, and say Ufat and I think lean into what uh, Rep Representative Presley was naming about organizing power is real power, about why we even have an equity order. And I hope to lean in a little bit more about what it means both to support and hold the administration accountable to, to the ideas that our communities have, have demanded. And so let me start out with just, uh, you know, and say you've dedicated your life to working on civil, human, and uh, worker rights issues. And as the executive director of the New Georgia Project, you lead the organization in strengthening the state's democracy. I know you all have, uh, have been working, uh, registering and engaging uh, around a million el eligible unregistered African Americans, uh, Latinos, and Asian Americans. And just wanna say we're really honored to have you join us to reflect on the one year anniversary of the Biden-Harris executive order on racial equity for government. Um, so let me start and say welcome. Let me, let me start by uh, uh, acknowledging the obvious. You know more than most, uh, given your, your life's work, the change has historically been driven by communities that organizing power is real power. Um, but in just a, a multiracial democracy that we all envision, community and government would be working far more closely together. Um, what do you think are the most important steps the federal government can take to work in partnership with communities of color in this moment? Uh, um, I think. One, uh, sort of establishing and communicating the intent and the desire. Um, I think that um, oftentimes when we are thinking about the strategy um, that is going to be required uh, to, to bring about some sort of policy change, right? Some sort of policy priority that comes from the administration that communicating to voters, communicating to the public often is seen as a marketing strategy, like a public relations strategy, like we have to go out and sell it. Right. And while that is absolutely necessary, when you're talking about the sort of deep, meaningful, lasting change that we seek to make, uh, it is always helpful uh, to include the communities that you seek, uh, that you are hoping will benefit from them in the planning, right? In the development, in the strategy. Um, because otherwise we find ourselves developing policy prescriptions to address issues that have not, that, that, that are not addressed by these policy prescriptions. And so again, thinking about community, thinking about community organizations um, as partners in the development of the strategy, the identification of the priorities, uh, the testing and the evaluation of whether or not these tactics actually even work um, is 
really, really important when we move into our civic engagement mode, right? And we start trying to mobilize young people and people of color to go vote. We talk about electing people who will co-govern with our communities. And that doesn't mean that, you know, again, when it's time to sell a bill um, that you run out and, you know, you have your, your latest uh, focus group tested messaging that co-governance means that you recognize and understand the importance of the community, the power of the people, and that it is present in every step, every decision-making step um, as we seek political and policy interventions that address the problems that we actually have that have been articulated by citizens. I so love that. I, 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 just naming, you know, intent and desire. It's a good place to start, right? Um, uh, and I love that you, you know, from, you know, thinking about bringing in community on the front end through the process, it just begs this question for me about what are the opportunities to be thinking about um, this as a, a democracy innovation lab? And what are the, some of the things that we might, might ask, some of the things you might have seen um, that could help us, you know, get into a space that, that allows us to, to at least test and practice in the way you were named? I love this question. Um, and part of it is because it is central to New Georgia Project's theory of change, right? Um, I think with a slight caveat is that we often, we lead or we prioritize um, uh, engaging municipal governments and state governments as sort of democracy innovation labs when we start thinking about our democracy work. But the federal government is absolutely a venue and a place for this to happen. Um, and I'll just give one little example. I was speaking yesterday to some leaders um, in the Emily's List Network. And we were talking about misinformation and disinformation and the role of the platforms and the role of the federal government and not wanting to, you know, infringe on Americans' First Amendment rights, et cetera. But um, and thinking about disinformation as a, 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 a serious threat uh, to our democracy that is a, presents a nation destabilizing threat that used to be a tactic that was from nation state to nation state. Right, that they would deploy their spies to pepper our, uh, you know, newspapers with misinformation. But now, um, you know, ordinary citizens can, can do it on social media. Right. I think about computers used to be this massive federal, it was the federal government that had the resources to invest in the first computer, right? And now we all have them in our pockets, right? Um, the same thing with municipal government, that there, when there is the intent and the desire, they have the resources to experiment with all manners of public policy solutions that are designed uh, to uh, you know, improve the lives of Americans, right? So I love that there are mayors who are thinking about, um, you know, universal basic income, right? And, 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 and getting that out and seeing what impact it has on the lives of their residents. I love that there have been cities and now states that are experimenting with and, and, uh, getting rid of cash bail. Mm -hmm. Right. And recognizing that um, the reason that many people are currently in prison or in jail waiting for trial is because they are poor. Right. And, and, and studying and evaluating those outcomes to see if they actually make our community safer and if they actually reduce recidivism. And so, again, while in our work in particular, we tend to focus on municipal and state governments. The federal government has a long history of innovating and experimenting and being entrepreneurial, right? And thinking about how to make our lives better. Uh, so um, now you got me fired up and, and you know, really leaning into, to your point, innovation always happens locally, right? Um, it always gets driven up. And, um, but I was really holding, in addition to this idea about innovation and evaluation, and even at the local level, thinking about your piece about misinformation and disinformation. And, you know, um, I mean, and I love that you, I mean, two years ago, you know, uh, that, that memo leaked about Russia intervening, intervening in the United States, 
for racial division purposes, right? Understanding how profoundly effective it is. And, um, and we see that in real time at local level right now, right? The attacks on critical race theory, the, uh, the attacks on government, even talking about racial equity. Can you share uh, any of your thoughts or ideas about how folks might think about responding to, to this moment around race and misinformation, disinformation? Absolutely. Um, so for me, the discipline that I have had to exercise in this moment as we deal with disinformation, sort of poisoning our information wells, is to recognize the role of these platforms like Facebook, <laughs> social media, um, the, how they work on algorithms, right? And that the algorithm doesn't really care about your analysis. So for an example, what I used to do, or what we used to do in the Georgia Project is if you would see somebody post disinformation or misinfo and say, you know, can't wait to see y'all uh, at the polls on Wednesday, November 6th, right? Knowing that for the history of this country, at least while all of us have been alive, most election days are the first Tuesday after the first Monday in November, right? And so what we used to do is re repost and be like, you know, look at this lying liar who's lying. Right. Mm. Um, but the algorithm doesn't care about our analysis. The algorithm cares that we reposted it, that we amplified it. Right. Mm. And so we are learning um, to one of the ways to sort of combat misinformation and disinformation is to be aggressive, equally aggressive in posting facts wow. and posting the truth. Uh, and, and fact checking. And so it's not, again, to amplify the disinfo but it's the amplify um, the truth as it as it exists. I think the second thing um, we used to joke uh, when we would uh, when our researchers would bring in misinformation that was having an impact in the audiences in the online communities that we care about, and we'd be like, okay, so is it the Russians or the Republicans, right? <laughs> and here's why we say that because it's no longer an exclusive tactic of again nation states to nation states. Uh, or it, that it has now been democratized the same way that we all have uh, computers and phones um, in our pockets, that, that we can see ordinary bad actors uh, in most instances, um, you know, with these well-funded campaigns, but they're no longer just foreign, it's foreign and domestic. And so I say that one of the ways that we address it is to address the strategy and not necessarily the tactic. And what I mean by that is that the strategy is to shake people's faith in our democracy, in the democratic process, sow the seeds of racial division, uh, make white folks mad, uh, and then like encourage them to behave badly in public, like showing up to school board meetings and trying to be disruptive about masks mandates or the uh, the new what's the new boogeyman oh critical race theory being taught yeah. to elementary school students right so those are the tactics but the strategy is to get people to think that the government is doing something nefarious that is going to harm them and that they should or that they should withdraw from the process because it doesn't matter because the leaders aren't accountable or they're going to pick who they want anyway and so our response is to one know our audience right so who are we trying to communicate with and how are they being mis um, impacted by this misinformation and so when we got very clear that we focus on gen z and millennials and people of color in rural georgia we got we realized oh those are dog whistles that are intended to talk to an audience that's not ours. Mm -hmm. So in our work, we are exercising the discipline to prep, to see uh, these conversations with messages that we know move our audience to act. So it is not necessarily responding to critical race theory. It's talking to our folks about the opportunity for educational debt elimination, because that is inspiring. And that is something that people want for their communities. They want for them themselves and their families. But that doesn't mean that that works for everyone else. But the way that we have, the way that we're combating it, again, is to be one, who are we doing this work for? 
Mm. Who listens to us? Who is our base? And how are they being impacted by disinformation? Mm -hmm. And then addressing those tactics. I, I so love it. You, you remind me of, of that, 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 that old story about life is about the wolf you feed, you know, where you put your energy is what you get back. Mm -hmm. And that um, both of the examples you were naming about, you know, uh, not amplifying the very things we don't want to amplify and never losing sight of our community. So central and so critical to organizing. And that's, I wanna shift for a second and ask you a question. So, you know, at Race Forward, we, uh, we uh, have the Government Alliance on Race and Equity. And we work with like 400 local, regional, some state jurisdictions. And it's really, uh, in addition to, to really thinking about moving policy, it's also just really recognizing the power of government employees. Um, uh, and, you know, uh, government is the largest employer of black and brown people in the country. It's not only the power of that group, it's how representative the group actually is of the very communities we care about. So my question after saying all that is any advice about thinking about organizing? I know you've had to deal with many folks, and I'm guessing both, both in positive and negative ways within government. Um, but any advice about organizing inside the institution that really would bring uh, allow us to be more effectively to lean into questions of race and democracy? Yes. Um, <laughs> and uh, anyone who's heard me speak before or anyone who will hear me again uh, will know that I believe in organizing. Right. Um, and oftentimes when we hear it, many people are thinking about maybe labor organizing, joining a union, and it includes that as well. But let me zoom out and talk about how we do what we do and, and why I think it could be effective for civil servants and people who are holding the line for us within the federal government. Um, you know, <laughs> I'm, I am a church girl and I'm from the South, so I can be forgiven for leaning into this metaphor. I think about the Georgia Mass Choir a lot and the idea that they are able to hold these really long and powerful notes. Uh, and it doesn't hit the same when I'm in my car singing by myself, right? <laughs> and part of it is because each individual vocalist is holding their note, is holding holding their peace, right? Yeah. And when one person needs to drop out uh, because they need to catch their breath or because you know, her vocal cords are just not built like that. Um, the idea is that the notes continues, the work continues. And so uh, when I think about the movement organizations, the community organizations, the, the, the employee resource groups that exist within these entities, it is organized people who create the demand for the change that we want to see and who sustain the demand that we want to see. And so when there are new generations of people cycling in and out of the choir, cycling in and out of the union, right, cycling in and out of the employee resource group, or when one individual has to drop out because of competing personal or professional obligations, that the commitment to equity, the commitment to whatever it is, will continue. That there are people who share your values and who have a vision for your agency and organizing yourselves in a sustained way protects the work first of all, so that if an individual gets hit by a bus or get fired or gets discredited or has some personal stuff going on, that the work continues. And it protects us like as individuals, because a lot of times nobody wants to be the tip of the spear. Like everybody doesn't want to be Harriet Tubman, right? And I get that. And here's the beauty of it. We don't all have to be Harriet. Some people have to follow the, the plan. Um, and so... I would say the number one thing that we can do for ourselves, and again, those of us, particularly within the federal government who are thinking about how to hold the line, where are your people? Where are the people who share your analysis uh, and are in a position uh, to develop a strategy to do something about it within the confines of, of your employment, of course. I so love, and I and I, I know you just made the day for a whole bunch of folk, folks who are 
who are feeling the struggle of what it means to be inside an institution, hoping for the best, uh, hoping for you know equity and justice. Um, and I want to I want to take us um, I, I want to bring us to uh, our last uh, question and say, and I want to we've been talking about um, how important local work is. And there's no question in my mind, you know, I say it all the time, civil rights movement was not a national movement, it was a local movement that was elevated. And um, deeply believe that that innovation we see, that the power of community, all of it is happening locally. This is a federal executive order. And um, just really wondering about your thoughts on why does this work of change at the federal level, why does it matter? And why does it matter for, for state and local folks as, as um, we think about our collective work? Man, it's so critical. I think one of the examples is like, you know, the OMB study that came out of the president's executive order that identified, what was it? onerous administrative burdens as one of the top barriers to equity in the federal government. Um, and at the New Georgia Project, we know the impact of administrative burdens far too well, um, particularly in the South, right? That, you know, it is a form of state violence when leaders who control the levers of government use administrative hurdles as a way to deny citizens access to the resources that their tax dollars pay for. Um, and so if there are folks who are responsible for um, executing those administrative burdens, uh, maintaining them, I imagine that there are, again, ways to address it within the context, within the confines of your employment um, as a sort of additional step or moving the ball forward um, as we talk about uh, you know, equity in all of its forms. And think about, again, go back to a state level, you know, these anti-voting laws are all like, you know, this is what you, this is the ID that you need to show in order to vote. We've changed it from 21 days of early voting to nine days of early voting. So the other thing is communicating. Right. Um, and so a lot of this stuff happens in the dark. They say democracy dies in the dark. Right. right. And so shining a light on some of these deficiencies from the federal government. Right. Acknowledging that there are processes that we maintain um, that are uh, creating harm. Um, is a big step. Now, again, how powerful it is, is connected to the ability to change those things, having the desire and the intent and the strategy to make significant changes in those regards. But those are definitely, like, again, coming from the federal government, coming from the OMB, uh, a, a recognition that there is movement that can happen that doesn't require a conventional, a congressional response or congressional approval, mm -hmm. I think is really important. And then federal funding. Um, we always coach and, and talk about throughout the context of our campaigns, uh, to follow the money, to follow the bag, uh, that it will illuminate the inequities that we are trying to address. And so where there are opportunities to make small investments or to make large investments or to shift and pivot, again, feels like something that can happen through the federal government, through its agencies, uh, without necessarily congressional approval, given that Congress is so broken. Right now. <laughs> I so I so appreciate and appreciate just um, the uh, all the wisdom and say I, I have to say it. Um, and you know I think as we're here to be celebrating this one year anniversary, we're also here to be real about how do we actually hold both um, folks accountable as we think about helping them understand how they can be successful. And, um, and so appreciate, I mean it in that way, the wisdom. I'm looking forward to us connecting again soon. Um, I'm also looking forward to just the, the ongoing success of Georgia Project. Um, you know, uh, as goes the South, so goes the country. I, I could not agree more and thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks so thank you. And I'm I have the great pleasure now. I'm gonna I'm uh going to introduce uh Chirag Baines. And um um 
Sure. I, and I'll just start by saying um, it's uh, thank you for joining us. Um, Shirag is the deputy director of the White House Domestic Policy Council for Racial Justice and Equity. Um, Shirag has a long and impressive history uh, from his work at Demos, where he led voting rights like litigation, um, and to his role within the Justice Department Civil Rights Division, and as senior counsel um, to the Assistant Attorney General. Uh, Shirag was a member of the team that investigated and sued Ferguson uh, uh, for constitutional violations. He's no stranger to the work for racial justice um, and really um, excited to have him here today with us um, to share some of his insights um, on um, where we're at in this moment, um, uh, acknowledging the year anniversary of the executive order for racial equity. And so with that, Shirag, welcome. And uh, let me um, uh, hand the floor to you. Thank you, Glenn, and thank you, Michael, um, for today's remarks and for all the speakers, what they've said today and the opportunity to be with you. Uh, decades of research and advocacy by PolicyLink, Race Forward, and so many other equity organizations have contributed to the environment and conditions that allow us to be driving forward this federal equity agenda. A couple of other speakers have made that point. I just want to make clear that is something that we acknowledge as well. Um, I want to, in particular, acknowledge NSA's path-breaking work. Nothing is more important than protecting the right to vote. Democracy depends on it. And that's why the president has repeatedly called on Congress to pass the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act and the Freedom to Vote Act, including by changing Senate rules to remove the filibuster for this purpose. I also want to thank Congresswoman Presley uh, for her partnership with the administration. And I am in full agreement with her that communities need to know and see how much of a priority equity is for the president, especially because we recognize that a fully functional democracy is a multiracial democracy. Now, I appreciate that you are supporters of the equity executive order and the administration looks forward to working with you in year two. And we have rounded the corner into the second year of this administration. And that means also the second year of our equity agenda. As you know, we're executing on a truly historic agenda. Within hours of taking office, the president charged the federal government with putting racial equity and justice at the heart of its work. The executive order, Executive Order 13985, launched a comprehensive initiative that infuses equity into every part of federal policymaking and decision making. The president put Ambassador Susan Rice, head of the Domestic Policy Council, or DPC, at the helm of that push. And I'm honored to lead, to lead the team at DPC that is driving forward the work to deliver on that charge. Now, the Equity EO is a transformational opportunity in the history of this nation to correct historic wrongs against underserved communities, to redirect federal programs and policies, and to invest in improving the lives of all Americans. Congresswoman Presley put it like, we have legislated um, harm, and it's time to legislate hurt and healing. That is also true of the administrative levers that we have at our disposal. We've got to be thinking about them that way, and we are within the administration. I want to share just a few examples of how the administration's actions, including the equity EO, are changing the way the executive branch and its agencies conduct business. First, the administration has prioritized equitable spending in the American Rescue Plan and other pandemic relief efforts to ensure that federal help is getting to the people who need it the most. The latest survey data from the CDC shows that 84% of Latino adults and 82% of Black adults have had at least their first shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. And that compares with 83% of white adults. Now these numbers were more skewed earlier in the pandemic and we worked to end the racial disparity. These are survey data and the, and the exact numbers change week over week. But the bottom line is that rates of vaccination among adults are effectively equal among black, white, and Latino individuals. And they have been since early fall. Nearly 5 million Americans have gained health insurance. And with the subsidies provided by the ARP, the American Rescue Plan, approximately 66% of black and uninsured adults now have access to a zero premium plan and 76% can find a low premium plan. 
Among Latino uninsured adults, 69% now have access to a zero premium plan, and 80%, 80% may now be able to find a or should now be able to find a low premium plan. You know, there's a lot of numbers I'm throwing at you, but the, the meaning, of course, is that we are dealing with the crisis in uh, in the gap in health insurance, which is a racial equity issue. Another important data point is the expansion of the child tax credit, major priority for the administration. It has kept 3.6 million children from poverty. That program cut the poverty rate among Black children by 22%, Latino children by 29%, and AAPI children by 23%. That was all in one year. Now, because the administration's emphasis on building wealth in communities of color and closing the wealth gap has been a priority as well, we have turned to federal contracting and procurement as a key lever for change. We announced a commitment to invest $100 billion additional dollars over the next five years in minority-owned businesses and other uh, small disadvantaged businesses. And all agencies are making important reforms to their contracting and procurement practices through the equity EO to meet this goal. This is how government does its work. What are our levers? One of the major ones is procurement, federal spending. Also, to support equitable grant making, the Department of Transportation built equity into the selection criteria for its grants announcements, including it's $890 million infrastructure for rebuilding America grants. DOT also imposed an unprecedented pause on a highway project in Texas, following complaints that the proposed highway widening would displace a, a largely black and Latino community. Uh, and the pause was for the purpose of reviewing civil rights and environmental justice concerns. That too is the product of this uh, intense focus on equity in everything that agencies do. Another example, recognizing that workers of color face inequitable barriers to accessing unemployment insurance, the Department of Labor released $260 million in equity grants to states. The purpose of these grants was to eliminate the barriers that disproportionately prevent workers of color from completing benefit applications. That's a very wonky government thing, but it's exactly what NSA was talking about. How do we identify and then pull down the barriers uh, and, the, and reduce the administrative burden of accessing federal funding? Since January, we've also delivered $5.8 billion in cumulative investment for HBCUs and increased the value of Pell Grants, which helps 75% of HBCU students afford their education. We've also taken historic actions with respect to tribal sovereignty and to support Native communities. This includes designing um, uh, programs that in particular target tribal communities, designating Bears Ears and other sacred lands as protected areas, 15 agencies entered into an agreement to protect tribal treaty rights. We launched a working group on respecting indigenous traditional ecological knowledge and provided $32 billion in aid to tribes under the American Rescue Plan. So this is, you know, again, that was a lot of data points, but the, the purpose is to identify that this has been a real priority throughout the administration. Now, the equity EO is a core component of the equity agenda. It's also only one element of a comprehensive agenda that also includes a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion, and accessibility in employment. This is a point that Glenn made as well. It's a major priority for the administration. On January 20th, we reached a major milestone. As I mentioned, of course, it was the one-year anniversary of the administration. It was also the uh, one-year anniversary of the executive EO, of the equity EO. And uh, on that date, we received over 90 reports, equity strategic plans from federal agencies. These are action plans to address the barriers identified during their equity assessments. Uh, these plans have been received by Ambassador Rice. And I want to say that over 50 of these plans were voluntary. That is, they weren't required by the equity EO. And yet exec agencies decided to submit these plans Nonetheless, my team is reviewing each and every plan. We'll be conducting aggregate analysis to determine how the government responded as a whole to the president's call to action. And I do look forward to sharing findings from the EO's implementation after the review is complete. Um, I know my time is coming short, so I'll wrap up here with just a couple of thoughts. You know, we're entering the phase two here. There are two things I want to share. One is we recognize that rooting out systemic racism isn't a one-year project. It's a sustained commitment. Our, amb our ambition is that equitable policymaking practices have to outlast this administration. 
So we've been building the muscles within government. We now have an opportunity also to flex those muscles, including through implementing the bipartisan infrastructure law. That is going to be a major focus for us. And we welcome your partnership in making sure that underserved communities can access those resources. The second thing is that another one of our priorities is going to be increasing the amount of engagement we do in developing and advancing the equity agenda. We are interested in working more closely with you, experts in equity, to identify priorities for equitable policymaking, to better design government programs and measure impacts, and to ensure that we are delivering in concrete ways for underserved communities. An equity agenda at this scale has never been attempted to date. We welcome the challenge and we look forward to working more closely with you to deliver an America in which everyone can thrive. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gerard. Um, I, I just wanted to say, um, lean into um, a couple of thoughts uh, as we do wrap up. Um, uh, and one is really just to acknowledge what uh, Gerard named at the um, end, which this is unprecedented. And I'm so appreciative, Gerard, of you sharing um, both the possibilities and some of the work that's already occurring. It's genuinely exciting. And I know for myself and, and Michael at PolicyLink, we are um, deeply excited about uh, the possibilities of how to support um, and make real um, the promise of those 90 agency plans, uh, whether that's thinking about policy change in the way um, uh, that Representative Presley named, whether that's just thinking about what can happen at the executive level and do daily actions in government that represent the potential of billions of dollars of resources and a different conversation in this country. Um, we are very much excited about um, uh, the potential as we wrap up year one. Um, I know, uh, Michael, uh, you and I wanna share maybe some closing thoughts and maybe I'll jump in. I know we have a few things we'd really love um, to highlight. We've been sharing some of them in the chat as we went through our conversation today. I just wanna start out by saying how I'm encouraged, genuinely encouraged I am about the moment, even as being realistic about the challenges ahead. One of the reasons I'm encouraged is that I really do feel like that the tools to support equity, to, to support advancing equity, are really finally starting to catch up with our aspirations for equity. And I'm really proud today uh, to be able to announce that Race Forward is publishing a new document, Advancing Racial Equity, a framework for federal agencies. We've been sharing it in the chat. Um, I hope you all get a chance to take a look at it. It is the uh, first in a series of resources that Race Forward, working in partnership with uh, PolicyLink, is preparing for civil servants who work at the federal level in the way that NSA was naming about how essential those folks are in making the promise of equity, the promise of democracy real. Um, and want to just give a special thank to our peer reviewers for their support. We got great advice from retired civil servants, local equity officers, and, um, and uh, representatives from uh, civil society. It's been wonderful to have this hour together for reflection um, on such a critical moment. There's nothing short um, of democracy on the line in this, con in this moment. We all know it. We all see it. We all feel it. And realizing that idea requires being honest with ourselves. Um, democracy has yet to meet its promise, especially to communities of color. We all know it's true, but it can. And in fact, it has to, because the truth is there is no functional, just multiracial democracy without racial justice. And we can't get to racial justice unless we have a functioning just democracy. They're inextricably intertwined. They fight to expand our democratic structures and create a just and multiracial democracy is the most important fight of the 21st century. Um, we can't achieve this just multiracial democracy without a strong and accountable public sector. Government matters, public servants, currently under attack um, in so many different ways as we discussed today, are really the frontline workers of our democracy. And they offer us, I think, the, uh, offer us the hope and, and light for how we might move forward and think about our democratic future. Um, it's why for us, um, our work with the Government Alliance on Race and Equity, um, working with over 400 jurisdictions across the country is so essential in really um, 
um, leaning into that idea of what is an innovation lab um, for democracy in this moment that centers equity and justice. Um, I just want to wrap up and say success requires that none of us sit this moment out, that we're all in. Equity is the work of right now, and the truth is it's the work of all of us. We have to move forward with urgency. We need to be unshakable in, um, and, in the clarity of why um, our vision for the world is one that will work for everyone, even in the face of backlash, uh, even in the, the face of white supremacy movements and, and other threats. We can never forget that we stand on the shoulders of giants, um, say it all the time, um, and that equity in this moment is the work of our generation. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. Um, for being part of this movement and moment for racial equity. And I want to hand it to Michael for his closing thoughts. Thank you, Glenn, for sharing your reflections. And thank you all to, to everyone who joined today. I especially want to thank those in community who have brought us this moment. Mm. Um, and a deep sense of gratitude to the Biden administration for doing something quite transformative, transformative and centering racial equity. Only a few remarks that I have today. And, um, they start with the belief that the mission of government is true. There's no debate about the mission to serve. The question now is, can we recognize that the North Star of fulfilling that mission is equity? And if you love all people and want to work on behalf of improving the lives of all people, we should not be ashamed to work on behalf of Black folks, Asian folks, white folks. It does not matter. And as an equity movement, it is time for us to raise our gaze from simply, simply being tasked to clean up the mess that has brought on us, our communities, by oppressive systems, and raise our gaze and do the thing that was always the invitation from the beginning of this nation, even though it didn't include me. Mm. And that is to continue to perfect this democracy. Glenn talked about generational work. This is the generational work. To compel the nature and the logic of our federal government to become anti-racist. Mm. That is the work of our generation. And if we do not achieve that, we forfeit the right to ask about results because you can't get them. Mm. Governing is the scaling vehicle in this nation. And it's time for all of us to stop cowering when we say the word equity. Mm. Stop cowering when we say poor whites, poor blacks, poor Asians, poor Latin folks. The definition of equity is just and fair inclusion into a society where all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. And there is an operative word in there that is key, all. The equity movement is not about exclusion. It is about getting to the all mm. without denying the fact that anti-Black racism runs through all of our institutions is the cancer that impacts everyone. Mm. So what I'm asking you to consider in year two is to continue to be bold, to continue to have the courage to own your people. Speak truth to power when you're in privileged rooms where they're not and carry their interest into those rooms, to continue to advance public policies that lifts them out of poverty. More important, recognize that there are some moments in our nation's history where the work that we're currently doing no longer serves us well. And this is one of those moments as Glenn spoke to. If we do not secure this democracy for everyone, the work that we're doing with our grants is quite irrelevant. The work that we're doing with our grants is quite irrelevant. It's time for us to join with folks on the ground. It's time for us to own a tagline that we use at our 2018 summit, our power, our future, our nation, and own this nation. You know, I don't begrudge those who want a very different America. It is their right to participate in this democracy as they see fit. But it is also our right to participate in this democracy as we see fit. So let's stop cowering and acting like we should be ashamed 
to say racial equity, that we should be ashamed to talk about race, that we're ashamed of that more than 100 million folks nearly who are struggling in this nation. There is a design challenge to this nation. It's not working for the majority of folks. And while we have made progress, the invitation to continue to perfect it exists. And that's what we're going to set about the work of doing, perfecting this democracy so that all can participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. Thank you for joining today. We'll make sure we share these resources with you and most importantly, share this webinar. Have a great day.